and good morning, UTRGV, live from our Edinburgh studio. You're listening to All In with Ali. 85 degrees here in Edinburgh and sunny. A very, very happy Halloween from all of us here at Vaquero Radio. Apologize in advance if my, if my voice sounds a little off today. It's allergies are not being very kind to me right now, but enough about me. Let's talk about sports and the biggest stories this week, starting with what happened last night. The MLB season, what could be perhaps one of the weirdest MLB seasons I've seen in a while, has come to an end, and we have a champion. The Los Angeles Dodgers are your 2024 World Series champions, taking the World Series title in a gentleman's sweep over the New York Yankees, three games to one. And there's a lot of things we can talk about in this series, but starting with Freddie Freeman, who earned World Series MVP honors, and what a performance he had. I mean, he was incredible. There was no doubt who was going to be winning World Series MVP since game one. The walk-off grand slam to take the first game of the series, which hasn't, which, uh, which harkens back to when uh, Kurt Gibson did it way back when, the last time the Dodgers won a full-season World Series title. Even Joe Davis made a nod to it in, a, in his call when he said, Gibby, meet Freddie. And, well, he's Freddie Freeman has certainly shot himself straight into Dodgers legend with that one. Six straight World Series games with a home run. That beats George Springer's streak of straight World Series games with a home run with when he had five between the 2017 and the 2019 World Series. Freddie Freeman did his uh, in, the, in 2021 when he, was a, when he was an Atlanta Brave. And then again with the Dodgers, that, series extended, uh, that streak extended across World Series games. And so uh, Freddie Freeman currently has the record with six straight World Series games in which he hit a home run. Question... Questionable things in game four of this World Series, the only game the Yankees won, that fan interference, that fan interference call that um, that cost Glaber Torres another pitch in that in uh, in that at bat, which which Mookie made the Mookie Betts made the catch down the right field line, and then a fan tried to go ahead and pry it out of his glove. I mean, come on, man. We, World Series tickets are what three, four thousand dollars. Just you spend four thousand bucks on a World Series ticket, and I get making a play for a foul ball that's like within the stands. That's one thing. It's a completely other thing to pry it out of a player's hands after he made the catch. That was, that was just straight up unacceptable. And imagine paying four thousand bucks for World Series tickets and not even being able to see the end of the first inning before you get kicked out. But it all came to an end in game five, and that was an absolute meltdown by the Yankees. It looks like they were starting out hot, you know. Aaron Judge, who had been silent the, uh, for most of the postseason and especially in the World Series, breaks through, hits a home run, put the Yankees on top two to nothing. Then Jazz Chisholm follows suit, three nothing, and then Giancarlo Stanton extends the lead as well. By the end, this came to the top of the fifth inning. Dodgers were down five runs, and Garrett Cole, who was the starter tonight, was cruising. I mean, he was he was doing the things that you'd expect Garrett Cole to do with how much money the Yankees are paying him. And then, and then that inning in Game Five. I mean, oh my God, that I don't know how to explain what I saw in that fifth inning. I mean, I've been wa I've been watching. Dear listener, I've been watching baseball for many years and never in my life in a World Series game did I see as poor of a defensive inning as the Yankees had in game five in the fifth. I mean, it all started when Judge missed an easy routine fly ball that you'd think that most center fielders would be able to catch it and Judge certainly expects to catch it with how good of a defender he is. But, yeah, th that was just no way to explain it. And then uh, Volpe throws it wide at third. And then another chance with two outs, he, uh, he misses the play at third base. And then, and then uh, with another chance to get out of the inning, a grounder to first. Garrett Cole didn't cover the bag, and Anthony Rizzo didn't speed to the bag. Nobody was covering first base, it seemed like. It was just unexplainable. I mean, 
The last time someone had this bad of a defensive inning I can recall was Nelson Cruz, game six of the, those of you listeners who are Rangers fans probably won't want to remember this, but 2011 World Series game six, Nelson Cruz uh, misses an easy fly ball that would have set the that would have won the Rangers their first World Series title. That would have had to wait until 2023 for it to happen. But yeah, Nelson Cruz game six, but then it wasn't one, it wasn't two, it was three huge defensive mistakes. And with a team that has a stack of a lineup as the Dodgers do. You can't really be making those kind of misplays. The Dodgers, of course, they capitalized on it. It was a bit of back and forth, but ultimately, the Dodgers came out on top. They're your World Series champions. That will close the books on the 2024 MLB season. As of right now, Juan Soto is a free agent at the end of the year. He said in a post-game press conference that he would likely be giving every other team a shot to sign him, and... Knowing he's a Scott Boris client, that probably means he's definitely going to test the waters in free agency. So it's not a guarantee that he uh, that Soto returns to the Bronx. Garrett Cole has an opt-out at the end of the season. We don't know if he's going to exercise it or not. But well, we all know that uh, after the Astros lost the World Series in 2019, he left the Astros clubhouse speaking, quote, as a representative of myself, wearing his agent's hat. So... Who knows what's going to happen next. We'll discuss that next week. What comes for the 2025 MLB season? What's going to happen this offseason? As of now, all teams have five days starting today to negotiate with their free agents exclusively before they negotiate with other clubs. We'll have that for you next week on All In With Ali. Stay tuned. We'll talk about El Clasico, Man United. We'll talk some college football after this. You're listening to All In With Ollie. Don't touch that dial. California Love, Tupac, and Dr. Dre to end that music break. Welcome back to All In With Ollie. A couple games to talk about in the college football landscape. Texas barely holding on to beat Vanderbilt last week. Last week in what was a closer showdown than it should have been. 27-24 was the final in that game. And it looked like for a for another week that that Vanderbilt was getting ready to get close to up, close to upsetting uh, Texas. They were trying to inch and make a comeback at the end. Of course, Texas scoring two touchdowns in the first quarter. They had the lead almost throughout this entire game, it seems like. But it was a little closer than it should have been. Remember, this is the same program that upset Alabama earlier this year. Then again, this year's Alabama doesn't really look the same as the Alabama under Nick Saban of years past. Another another thing I'd like to make a quick note about, Aggies beating the brakes out of LSU this week. As of now, they are the only team with an undefeated record in the Southeast uh, in the in the SEC right now. 5 and 0 oh, and the next closest team is 4 and 1. Very interesting times going on in the SEC. We still have that future clash between the Ags and the Longhorns coming up, but that's not going to be for a while. So in the meantime, in the meantime, both of these teams are going to be vying for the for that top spot and vying for an SEC championship. I think I think it's an exciting time to be a football to be a college football fan here in Texas, especially with the two teams that you expect to be at the top in A and M and UT. They're going at it. They're they're going at it. They're doing their own thing, and they're getting ready for an epic duel in a few weeks' time. So that's, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be great times coming up in college football and in the SEC. Some matchups I would like to keep an eye on for for next week. We got we got 18 Pitt against 20 SMU. Both of these teams are ranked. Georgia, Florida, that's always always an interesting duel. Georgia, of course, ranked number two in the country right now. And at and four and three, Ohio State versus Penn State. Again, these are two top, top teams in the country. That that game should be the game to keep an eye out. That's gonna happen Saturday at eleven AM. Another thing I'd like to talk about was El Clásico happened this week, as you may or may not know that game ended in a blowout win for Barcelona on the road in Madrid that ends Madrid's unbeaten streak in La Liga I don't 
had a, it looked like uh, Madrid was cruising into this game, but they were they got complacent and and the better team that day won. That's it's as simple as that. Lamin Yamal, he's he's an incredible player, and you and yet you have to know that going into it. And I just don't think Madrid were they were they weren't ready, and that's what happens when you get caught napping. Well, in any sport, but in in in, in soccer in particular, with the ebbs and flows that can happen, even in a half or in during the game, you get caught napping and you get caught asleep in the wheel. You're going to crash, and that is sim- that that as that's as simple as it gets. That's what happened here. Another another big thing that happened, Man United this week, a lot of drama going on there. Eric Ten Hag was sacked. He was fired earlier this week. And Ruud van Nistelrooy, who played Man United for several years, he's the interim manager. And for for many years, uh, Ten Hag was blaming everyone other than himself for, for, United's, for United's failure. But now he's not, but now he was the one who had uh had the blame placed on as he was shown the door. First game back, 5-2 to two win over Leicester City in the EFL Cup. There's still a lot of groundwork left to do if you're Man United right now. As of, as of today, they still sit in 14th place in, in the Premier League in the bottom half of the table. So if they want to get even close to a, to a Europa or a Champions League spot, they got to start getting to work. They got to start putting the work in. They got to start making up ground. And that has to start now or it's not going to happen. We'll talk a little bit of NBA in the next segment. Don't touch that dial. We'll be back after the break. You're listening to Vaquero Radio, the Valley's student station. And the theme from Halloween to close out that break. Welcome back to All In with Ali. Let's talk. Let's talk NBA for a few minutes here for the third seg- for this next segment of the show. Starting in the Western Conference, and Spurs kind of getting out to a very slow start, losing to losing to the Mavs, the Rockets, and just recently the uh, the the Thunder. I mean, in in the one win they did look good, and they are scoring. It's just kind of falling flat, and it's been a been a bit of a skid to start the year. And uh, that's that's one thing that I am sort of concerned about the Spurs is not letting them get enough minutes for when, for Victor Wembanyama. Uh, we had the same issue with it last year where I, I get that because he's entering the league at 19. You should probably limit some of his minutes, but he's had a full year to condition. He's had a full year to sort of get ready, and I get some of the limit the, the minute limits, but it – at some point, at some point, Pop's got to drop the minute limit and start letting him play. Maybe if not this year, then next year to start getting him more more experience in the more experience on the court. But on the other side of the coin, Thunder, the Thunder, the Warriors, and the Mavs out to fast starts. Specifically, I want to talk about the Mavs. You know, they look good. They got they got to the Spurs in the first game of the year. And then uh, Luka Doncic doing what he does best. I mean, Mavs look like a very, very strong contender to win the West out of the gate. And Luka, once again, doing what Luka does. He, uh, speak, on, on Halloween, uh, talking about haunting, Luka has haunted the Minnesota Timberwolves. He just did it recently at the buzzer against them, hitting a game-winning shot kind of giving them flashbacks to when he was hitting shot after shot after shot after shot against these Wolves in the playoffs. I mean, it's just incredible to see that. And I think we can say that Luka owns the Minnesota Timberwolves at this point. I mean, he he owns the Timberwolves. He knows it. The Wolves know it. I mean, at some point, there's just nothing you can do to stop him. Let's go out to the East. Cavs looking undefeated. To, they are undefeated to start the season, and the Celtics look strong to start the year. As of right now, the Cavs are five and zero. The Celtics are four and one. Once again, Celtics looking like the strongest contender, one of the strongest contenders in the East, and the Cavs looking good. In other news, in the East, the Sixers were fined one hundred thousand dollars for uh, for their public statements on Joel Embiid's health. We talked about this last week as to what was going to happen to the Sixers. Well, now we got our answer. They were fined 100000 but that's not the biggest story. The biggest story surrounding the Sixers at the moment 
is that they don't look good right now. I mean, it's really, really early. They, it, it, we still got about another un, just a little under 80 games to play on the year, but they are 1-3 and three to start the year, and they've looked flat. They, they fell flat in their last couple of games, so turnaround's got to start happening soon. And other news in the East, Dwayne Wade got his statue in front of uh, in front of uh, the American Airlines Center, or what was then known as the American Airlines uh, Center, or American Airlines Arena, right, mind you. That's what that's what I knew it as when the Spurs played back to back finals in that arena. I don't really know off the top of my head what it's called now, but that's pro that's what I'm going to keep referring it to as. Anyway, Dwayne Wade got his statue, and to be honest, they probably could have. They probably could have waited a year or got someone else to do it because, I mean, my God, that uh, it, it does not look good. The statue did not look great. I know uh, Dwayne Wade looked puzzled. A lot of people inside of NBA circles, they were puzzled about it. And, you know, who knows? Perhaps they might have perhaps they might have been better off, you know, not even bothering in the first place or getting someone else to design the statue. Anyway, we'll talk NFL this week in sports history and much more coming up after the break. And the Nightmare Before Christmas, a little music from that great film. To close the music break on Vaquero Radio, welcome back to All In with Ollie. Let's recap week eight of the NFL, starting with, starting with the Niners and the Cowboys. I mean, once again, once again, how about them Cowboys, huh? <laughs> oh, my God. Both teams going into this game dealing with uh, dealing with mountains of injuries, right? But there's three things that you can always be certain of in life. Death, taxes, and the 49ers owning the Dallas Cowboys on primetime television. I mean, oh, this it was it was close at some point, but you just knew the Niners are going to win this game. They always beat Dallas. They can't beat San Francisco. They can't beat Green Bay. We've known this for a while, and folks, I'm sorry to say it, the Dallas Cowboys do not look like a playoff team. I, I, I would be very surprised to see them make the playoffs. I mean, this offense runs through CeeDee Lamb and Dak Prescott. Take any one of those two out. The Dallas Cowboys can't run the ball. Their other they don't have very many other receivers other than uh, solid receivers other than CeeDee Lamb. This defense... This defense has more holes than Swiss cheese, and I mean, it, 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 the, the Cowboys are not going to make the playoffs. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, and I would be surprised if they do. Next, to, next, let's talk about Colts-Texans, and I mean, this was incredibly stressful, more stressful than it should be. I mean, as a fan of the Texans, I would like to say this is probably the most stressful season that I've been seeing a team at 6-2. and two. The, the even though they came out with the win thanks to the defense, the Texans will have lost Stephon Diggs for the year. They need to get wide receiver help at the deadline, even with Collins coming back. The O-line is questionable. I mean, questionable is an understatement. The Texans' O-line needs some serious help, and they got to get active at the deadline if they want if they want any chance of making a deep run this year. The expectation last year last year was more or less, a, let's see where our rookie quarterback takes us. We know what C.J. Stroud can do. We know what this offense can do. Give Stroud time in the pocket, and he can do special things. But you got to start by giving him a pocket, you know? This O-line needs to improve if the Texans want to get anywhere, all right? It's as simple as that because this defense is great. The offense is good when it gets going. The only problem is it all starts and ends at the offensive line. Without an offensive line, you can't do anything. Ravens, Browns, Lamar Jackson falling flat, and the Browns looking like a completely different team without Deshaun Watson. I mean, you'd think Jameis Winston was the next coming of Tom Brady with how good the Browns looked that day. I mean, it, 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 it's kind of understandable. You go from a huge quarterback change from, from I mean, Jameis Winston, he's an okay quarterback, he, but he's always entertaining to watch, and, he, and he's, a, he's, a, he's an incredible teammate too. But that's besides the point. This team looks completely different when you don't have Deshaun Watson, who was, before he got injured, the statistically worst quarterback in football. Like Every measure backed this. I mean, the stats backed it up. The eye test backed it up. I mean, 
that I, it was very questionable that the Browns even traded for Watson in the first place. And without him, they look much better. Same way they looked so much better with Joe Flacco under center last year. Giants and Steelers, I mean, vintage, vintage Russell Wilson in the Steelers win. I mean, look, Russell Wilson looked like he did back when he was with the Seahawks and competing for Super Bowls. And just another hilarious play I want to talk about. I mean, what was that attempted two-pointer? What was what was Daniel Jones trying to do? What was Dable trying to do? What 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 were they even thinking? They were trying to lateral on a two point conversion. I mean, come on, come on, and it it's as about as about of a, as about as hilarious of a Giants play as you'll ever see. On the other side of MetLife Stadium, Jets Patriots. I mean, the Patriots. I mean, they didn't play at MetLife, but you get my point. The Patriots are a terrible team, and they lost Drake May in this game. Yet somehow. The Jets found a way to drop it. I mean, you'd think with all the weapons they have on offense and with as good of a Jets defense as they always seem to have, you'd think they'd get this one easy with a with a Patriots team that's that doesn't have Tom Brady under center, that doesn't have nearly the offensive weapons that that the Patriots used to have when they uh, when they shelled the Jets twice a year way back when. This is not a good Patriots team, and yet the Jets still found a way to drop it. And I mean, the Aaron Rodgers experiment has failed. The Jets are two and six. You think it might be time to start questioning some decisions, some decisions that have been made. It might be time to blow it up again. That's enough about week eight. Let's look forward to week nine and two matchups I really want to talk about. Two offensive shootouts that I think will happen this week, starting with Dolphins Bills in the AFC East. Both of these teams have great offenses. We know this. Dolphins just got healthy. They lost to the Cardinals last week, and they are eager to get back to try to sneak back into that playoff picture while the Bills are trying to maintain their hold on the AFC East. This should be a great game on Sunday. Another game I want to talk about on Sunday, Lions-Packers in the NFC North Showdown. Two of the best offenses with two incredible quarterbacks and two solid defenses in the Lions and the Packers in the NFC North. Now, if you ask me, this is probably a game that a couple weeks ago should have been flexed to prime time. But, alas, here we are. Lions-Packers at 3 o'clock. Make sure to tune in for that. On this day in sports history, let's talk about it. In 2014, there was an incredible class inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2014. Many baseball legends made their way into Cooperstown, such as a trio of Braves from manager Bobby Cox, to two aces in Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin when back when they were the best ro- one of the best rotations that baseball had ever seen. Other managers as well, from Joe Torre to Tony LaRu- Joe Torre and Tony Larusa, both were inducted into the Hall of Fame and are forever enshrined in Cooperstown, New York. In 2017, the Los Angeles Dodgers forced Game Seven of the World Series in a bullpen low-scoring game. Dodgers won that game three to one to force Game Seven after. What was an incredible was an incredible game in Game Five back in Minute Maid. Of course, what ended up happening the next day? The Astros beat the Dodgers five to one to secure their first World Series title in franchise history. In 2019, Joel Embiid suspended for two games for getting into an alteration with Carl Anthony Towns. And in 2021, Astros forced Game Six of the World Series against the Braves but they would end up falling 7 to nothing in game 6 for Atlanta for Atlanta to take their first World Series title since 1995 and earn Freddie Freeman his first of two World Series rings in his career. Well, that's it for the programming here on Rock Ghetto Radio, but a couple of reminders before we before we leave to before we leave today's programming. Early voting ends tomorrow and election day is Tuesday, so make sure to cast your ballots. Don't forget also, we got some great programming coming up on Vaquero Radio. 10 o'clock tomorrow, 10 a.m. tomorrow, tune in for Office Hours with Dr. V. Newscasts on Monday and Wednesday at 11 a.m. SGA Insider at 12.30 on Monday and 2 p.m. The Lounge to round out some great programming here on Vaquero Radio. I'd like to thank you so much for tuning in this week. We got, we got more NFL to talk about next week. There's a lot more sports to talk about all the time, so don't forget to tune in. Thank you guys so much for listening, and you stay classy, 956. Have a great one.